And there's the title. <laughs> Characteristic classes in Vit cohomology. So, yeah, th this is one aspect of uh, classical call it enumerative geometry, which we haven't discussed, is how you uh, understand how to compute, or how do you compute actually characteristic classes of bundles for the base. So let me just review the Grotendieck theory. So the classical theory. Chuck already mentioned this. If you have a vector bundle on some x, then you can associate to it uh, churn classes, ci of v, living in chow i of x. For simplicity, let's just assume x is smooth over our, uh, over our field. So x over our field is smooth. It's not necessary. OK, so let me remind you how this goes. Um, you first do it for line bundles. For a line bundle, well, we've already seen how to do this. You just uh, do this Euler class construction for the line bundle. Right? You define. So the Chow groups, remember this is the simple theory. It's, right? And these have pullbacks and push forwards. You don't have to worry about orientations or anything. It's, you know, life is easy. So C1 of L, right? Here's the, you have the zero section. It's just S0 lower star, S0 upper star of one on X. Good. And this has the property, there are various properties like C1 of L tensor M equals C1 of L plus C1 of M. It's functorial. Very good. And then you have the important splitting principle. Well, you have the projective bundle formula, sorry. So the second ingredient is the projective bundle formula. It says if you now take a vector bundle, say rank R, then you can form the associated projective space bundle. And this has, um, okay, this has a, let me use the subbundle version. So this has the pullback of the Vector bundle has this tautological subbundle. So P of V is just the lines in V, right, at each fiber. And so this is the bundle which at a point is the line inside of V. Okay? This is the tautological subbundle. And then you have uh, let's uh, see the C1 O minus 1. And then um, you have the following formula that the, uh, the Chow ring of P of V is a free Chow sub X module with basis. One C C to the uh, R minus one. So that says you have a certain relation. You have um, relation C to the R plus summation minus one to the I uh, C I. Let's say Q star of X I. C to the R minus I equals zero for unique XI in Chow I of X. And that's how you define the CIs of V. Okay, so that's how you get that. And then you have various properties. Uh, you have so Cartan form. So you define the total churn class of V to be one plus C one of V plus, plus 
the R of V, the higher ones vanish, and you have things like if you have an exact sequence, it implies that the total Chern class of V is the product. Okay, so then based on that, you have what makes computations easy is you have the splitting principle. which says that given x, let's, let's assume that it's, uh, oh, it doesn't really matter. So given our x and a vector bundle v on x, there exists, let me just call it this thing here, there exists a map pi such that, I mean, it's not, there's a canonical construction of this, but we don't need it and such that, uh, first of all, pi star from chow star of x to chow star of this splitting variety v is injective. And secondly, pi star of v is isomorphic to a sum, so v has, again, rank r, i equals 1 to r, of certain line bundles here. These are line bundles. So you all recall the elementary symmetric functions. These are given by, you define the elementary symmetric function EI, or how do you want to call them? Sigma I of variables X1, X2, etc., whatever Xn is just equal to the coefficient of T to the I in this product, the elementary symmetric function, and this just says that if you take, I'm going to omit the pi star because it's in, I think of now the chow ring is just sitting inside here, it says that the to, that ci of v is just the ith elementary function in c1 of l1, c1 of lr. Okay? Good. That's a property. There exists. That's if you, yeah, but you can then go further and split it. Believe me, this works. I really can talk about it later. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, why is this useful? So, this is useful for calculating the total churn class of related bundles. I mean, that's, there's not, it's not a, in other words, what's a related bundle? Well, for example, uh, let's say, here's an example. Suppose you get formula, anything you can do, you can take tensor products, exterior powers, apply any sure symmetric powers, any sure functor, and this will give you a way of calculating the total churn class of that thing if you just know enough about symmetric functions. So, for example, uh, let's say rank of V is 2, and we want to calculate sim, the total churn class of sim 3, or let's say, let's say C4 of sim 3 of V. So, this is, this is a rank 4 bundle. We want to calculate its top churn class. Why is it rank 4? Because, see, you think of it having two, two, two variables, E1 and E2, a little basis, and then sim3 will be polynomials of degree 3, homogeneous, so it has E1 cubed, E1 squared, E2, E1, E2 squared, E2 cubed, right? That will be a basis for the fiber of sim3, it's dimension 4. Good, okay, so it's a rank 4 bundle, and how do we do this? Well, uh, you can, so the splitting principle says, You can pretend that V is a sum of two line bundles, right? Because if we have a formula, if V is a sum of line bundles, once we split V, then we also split sim3 of V, right? And if we have a formula for the churn classes of sim3 of V, then it'll be some formula in the churn classes of these line bundles, 
and it will be a symmetric function, and so we'll be able to express it in terms of the churn classes of V. So once we write down that expression, how do we check that it's correct? Well, we just look here, and the map in child groups is injective, so it has to be correct. So the splitting sensible says we can pretend, I mean, assume is maybe, but let's just pretend that V equals L1 plus L2. Okay, and then this formula for what sim3 is, that says sim3 of V is L1 tensor 3, direct sum L1 tensor 2, tensor L2, direct sum L1 tensor L2 tensor 3, direct sum L2, uh, sorry, tensor 2, tensor 3. And now, so what's C4 of sim3? So it's a sum, these are all line bundles. It's a sum of four line bundles, so it's equal to the fourth symmetric function in C1 of these four line bundles. Okay, so now we, I mean, but this fourth symmetric function in four variables is just the product. Okay, and now we use the property that C1 is additive with respect to tensor product. So what is this? This is 3 times C1 of L, right? That's this one, times, this gives me 2 times C1 of L plus C1, uh, sorry, L1, L1, L2, times C1 of L1, plus 2 times C1 of L2, times 3 times C1 of L2. Okay, so it's obviously a symmet... I mean, should we... Just for fun, let's... do the calculation. See how easy it is. So, anybody have the answer already? So, what do we get? We have a 9 C1 L1 C1 L2. And remember, this is sim 2 of C1 L1 C1 L2. So, this is C2 of V. And then times, yeah, if I multiply this in my head, what do I get? I get 4 C1 L1 squared, and then I have uh, 5 C1, L1, C1, L2, plus, then it should be... Six, six, not four. Oh, it's two. It's two, not four. It's two, four, and one is five. And then, and then two. Right? So you have a... 2c1 squared, and then a 4, and 1 is 5, times the cross terms, and then 2 times that. I think that's right. Okay, so still have 9c2v, and now we can factor this. Well, the other symmetric function is the sum, and this looks almost like twice c1l1 plus c1l2 squared. And if we were to do that, we get a 4, and here we have a 5, so we have to add back C1, L1, C1, L2. Right? Is that correct? And so what do we get? This is, of course, C1 of V, so we get 18 C2 of V times C1 of V squared plus 9 times C2 of V squared. Okay, so that's a typical example. Okay, and so to get, it's, it's probably not so easy to get nice closed form formulas, you can imagine, but in any particular case, given enough time, 
and patient, you can figure out the answer. So at least you have that. It's not a theoretical problem, really. Okay, good. So what do now, in our situation, so for us, lots of problems. We only have, we don't have, I mentioned this already, sort of lower Euler classes. And uh, so we don't, there's not really a nice, in other words, there's no nice projective bundle formula. We could take the Euler class of a line bundle, but as you'll see, that's also not very effective. Okay, so there are lots of problems. No projective bundle formula, blah, blah, blah. This is in the theory when we're looking at H star, Milner Witt star. Okay, our Chow. Chow groups. So there's a correction. The, the correction is solution to this. And this actually seems to work more or less. This is still a work in progress, so we won't get a complete answer, but you invert eta. So you look at, so remember we had this eta was this element in Milner Witt minus one for any field. So it just lives everywhere. And so if you take Milner Witt star, the sheaf, and then invert eta, so it gets rid of the grading. And remember that this multiplies, you know, multiplication by eta. This is, of course, just the direct limit over n of, you know, multiplication by this thing into this thing. But remember that uh, m minus n, this is degree minus 1, and recall that Milner Witt minus n, uh, n is equal to the Witt sheaf for all n positive. And in fact, multiplication by eta, this equal, is just means it's the nice, it's, it can, it's just the same equality. I mean, so this, via this isomorphism, this multiplication by eta just acts by the identity. So this co-limit is just w. Okay. Good. And, uh, so, but we can still, so we still have, still have our Euler classes. Pardon me? Well, I mean, I'm just saying inverting eta is the same as taking the colimit. But I already have an eta. Whatever. It's, this is, it's W. <coughs> really. We're not, we're not on the same page. Yeah. Good. Okay. That happens. Okay, so we still have our Euler classes. Okay. Um, so for any vector, for example, for a line bundle, or, yeah, our Euler classes. But remember, for a line bundle, or for any odd rank bundle, if eta times E of L was zero, because for any odd rank bundle this is true, so we don't have Euler classes of line bundles. This is true, in fact, for any, I mentioned this, if you take any odd rank bundle and you multiply by eta, the Euler class is zero. So the best thing you can start for is rank two bundles. That's the lowest even rank bundle there is. Okay, so this brings in work of Panin and Volta. It's really fundamental work. What they do is they consider the, all these things I'm going to say are in more general settings. Therefore, are lots of cohomology theories that satisfy certain properties, and all these properties are satisfied by the cohomology theory represented by the cohomology of the Witt sheaf. So it's it's okay for this theory. It's okay for lots of other theories, but I'm not going to talk about those. So they consider the following gadget. They consider 
symplectic bundles. So what's a symplectic bundle? Let's say V omega. It's a bundle of just a vector bundle plus omega, an al uh, alternating form. Alternating non degenerate form. That's a symplectic bundle. It's a pair. Okay? And so these are, these, they're always even dimensional, right? And now you can consider, um, for any such V, you can take its Grossmann of two planes in V. Right? And this will be a bundle over X. It's like taking the, the lines in V, now you take the two planes in V. But this doesn't reflect the, symmet the symplectic structure. I just take all the two planes. But inside of here, I have the symplectic, H stands for symplectic, cross <laughs> money, sorry about that. That's, these are the two planes, two plane, such that if I take omega and restrict it to u, is non-degenerate. Okay? Right? So here I have the universal two-plane bundle here. Here I have its restriction. Let's call it HE2. And this has a canonical symplectic form. I'll just also call it omega. I just take the omega on the V and restrict it. So this is a rank two symplectic bundle. And let's define. So, yeah. You just restrict. V has a form. So V is not here, right? E2 is a subbundle, if this is pi, pi star of V. And so you have the form on V gives you a form on pi star of V, non-degenerate. And it gives you a form on each of the, on E2, but it's not non-degenerate. And you, this is actually an open subscheme. This is open subscheme of the two planes for which this form is non-degenerate, and that's what you need to get a symplectic rank two bundle. There it is. So this thing is called HP1 of V. This is the, this is the P1, this is HP of V. This is the P, this is the projective version of the projective bundle over V for symplectic. Okay? You can't do lines because they're never symplectic and you do planes and that's the definition. What is the connection between HE2 omega and HPV? Are they just the same? This is, HE is the bundle over HPV. This is a bundle. And this is equal to, this is notation for this thing. Okay? So, this is a rank two bundle, the omega gives a canonical identification, right? If you have a rank two symplectic bundle, you have a trivialization of its determinant because uh, a form alternating means a map from V wedge V to OX. That gives you a map of V, right? V, and if it's rank two and non-degenerate, it's an isomorphism. So omega gives you a trivialization of the determinant bundle. So you have the Euler class of this thing in a canonically trivialized version, well, of Milner K1. You can then multiply by high enough power of eta to give you something in omega. So we define B1 of this bundle, H2E, with the omega to equal eta to whatever power you need times the Euler class of H2 of E. And this will live in H1 on the HP of V with coefficients in W. Okay? The Euler class, oh sorry, in H2. The Euler class here would live in H2 Milnervit K2 and then you just multiply by eta so it lands in W. <laughs> this is the so-called Borel class. Okay? So this E, H, E2, 
plays the role of the O of minus 1. This is our O of minus 1. It's the canonical sub-bundle of the pullback of V. So, the next theorem is they calculate, again, this works for many more cohomology theories, but <coughs> remember the Okay. So this B1 is like our C that we had before in the familiar projective bundle formula for P of the chowering of P of V. So theorem Pani Walter. That um and this works for any, I'll just mention it for this one. So for any, yeah, let's just say that the cohomology of H, P, of V with coefficients in W is a free uh, module over the cohomology of X, with W, with basis one B one of H E two B one to some power. So what was the power? I guess uh, H E two to the R minus one, and this is where the rank uh, v should be 2r. I think this is right. It doesn't, it's, uh, yeah, I think this is right. I think that's, that's right. Yeah, okay, good. So now, is this right? Let's see. Uh, yeah, rank 2n. Okay, so hp, maybe I could call this hp, whatever. Okay, so, yeah, good. So, if definition, we define the higher Borel classes, B of V. Oh, so that's, okay, it's free. So it means in particular that the, co the pullback of the cohomology here into here is injective. Okay, so we define this thing by as the unique elements so bi of v is in h 2i of x w satisfying if i call this guy c c to the r plus summation minus 1 to the i uh, I'll omit the pullback, B I of V, C to the R minus I equals zero. The ith Borel class. Okay, well and good. And these satisfy the Carton formula. So if we have V, well, it's a little different because we need a symplectic structure. So if we if v omega is equal to v prime omega prime direct sum v double prime omega double prime. So it means the form here is the direct sum of these two forms. Then the total Borel class of b omega. So it really should write b omega here because it depends on that is equal to the product of these guys. Okay, that's the analog of the Carton formula. And, um, uh, yeah? The dependency of the, of the form, is, so there you use the form to trivialize the determinant of the determinant of the right? Okay. No, it's used to trivialize the determinant of the HE2. Okay. Yeah, there but it's used to define everything also, right? I mean, the 
The variety depends on the form. The HPV, there should be an omega in there. It really depends on omega. Okay. Sort of. Okay. Whatever. Not really, but <laughs> in any case, it's in there. Let's leave it in there. Okay. But what if I don't have a symplectic bundle? What do I do then? Well, any symplectic bundle, any bundle, so now let V to X be an arbitrary vector bundle, say of rank R. Then I can form maybe too many H's, but sorry, you form the hyperbolic symplectic bundle, it's V direct sum V dual. And this has a canonical symplectic form, right? You define omega by the following matrix, 0, 0. You have the canonical pairing here. I don't know, maybe put the canonical pairing here and minus the canonical pairing here. Up to sign, it's unique, right? Pardon me? No. It's not one, it's zero. V pairs with V by zero. In other words, if I have A, B paired with C, D, this is equal to B on C minus uh, D on A. That's the definition. Are you asking about this matrix? I don't know what you're asking. This is correct. And this is the formula, so we can discuss it afterwards. Okay, so um, that's a symplectic bundle, and we make the following definition. The ith Pontryagin class of my V, this is Pi of V, and now it's in H, 4i of x, w is b2i of h of v. Okay? And there, they prove, this is also definition due to Pani and Walter, and they show that the, that the b2i plus 1s of this h of v are 0. So these are the only interesting ones, and we define the total Pontryagin class as the sum. This satisfies a Carton formula in exact sequences for V prime to V to V double prime to zero. And so it's a nice gadget. Okay, so that's the now, maybe uh, for the topologists in the audience, you're probably familiar with the classical Pontryagin classes, which is you have a real bundle on some topological space. You can tensor with C, making a complex a bundle, and then you can take its even churn classes, and that gives you the Pontryagin classes. So this is the algebra. We don't have complexification in this city, in this setting. So we replace complexification with symplectification, and that gives the pont that's why they're called Pontryagin classes. You don't care. It may have some, I don't know, it may have, I mean, it doesn't change the definition. It may have some consequences for that because uh, it's, I don't know, there might be some consequences but I don't know what they are. I'm new to this game. So, it's a good question. But it doesn't affect the definition. Okay, so far so good. So, so those are our characteristic classes. Instead of the Chern classes, we have the Pontryagin classes, and they satisfy this uh, Carton formula in exact sequences, so we're in good shape. Um, but then what about the splitting principle?
Well, maybe just um, splitting principle. So this is, we have a splitting principle. So this is the SL2 splitting principle. So we now restrict ourselves to bundles with, with a trivialization of the determinant. Okay, so let's let V and rho, it's a bundle over X, is an SLN bundle, means that V to X is a rank N vector bundle, and rho is an isomorphism of the determinant bundle of V with the trivial bundle. That's an SLN bundle. Okay, and every SLN bundle, it's the same as saying you have a vector bundle with group reduced to SLN. Okay, so now, um, yeah, I have possibility of doing two things. So maybe I should have said this in the beginning, so recall that uh, there's this gadget BGLN, which is equal to sort of a union. You can write it this way. It's a union of the Grassmannians of n planes in n space as n goes to infinity. Okay, and there's a universal bundle on this thing, EN, and this thing classifies, I'll put in quotes, classifies rank n vector bundle. on algebraic varieties in the following sense. In the following sense, that given some V on some X, then there exists some X tilde, and this X tilde induces an isomorphism in any motivic cohomology theory. So I'll just say motivic equivalence. This is just, I'm, I'm assuming X is quasi-projective in some projectives. This is just the Joanalu device, if you know what that is. It's an affine space bundle over here, so it gives you an isomorphism in any motivic cohomology theory, together with a map to some Grassmannian or some large N. Here we have the rank N bundle over this Grassmannian such that, and an isomorphism of pi star of V isomorphic with rho star of E and N. And in fact, if I take the, if I can take the Chow ring of this Grassmannian, B, G, L, N, and this is just equal to uh, Z adjoin the Chern classes where CI is equal to CI of this universal bundle. And so what it means is, and in fact, right, by the functoriality of the Chern classes, it means, at least up here, the Chern, the i Chern class of V is gotten by pulling back the i Chern class of the universal bundle on this thing by this map rho, right? This thing sits inside of BG, L, N. Here I have E. Okay, good. So, I mean, roughly speaking, that's the story. Okay, so there's a similar story, similar story for SLN bundles. So you have to ask yourself how, if, if this is the universal guy for bundles, rank N bundles, what's the universal guy for rank N bundles with a trivialization of the determinant? Well, I take the universal bundle here, I take its determinant, okay? So that'll, let's call that O of 1. So let's let O of 1 over V, G, L, N. I'm not going to, I'm going to just think of it as one of these guys, but I'll just always write this thing here. So if you like algebraic varieties more rather than this limit, you can do that. This will just be the determinant of this E, N as a bundle over... BGLN, 
And in, how do I trivialize the determinant inside of here? I have O of 1 minus the 0 section. And there's always a canonical coordinate on here. There's a canonical section of this bundle over itself. And so this bundle has a canonical trivialization of itself, because I've removed where the section is 0. And this thing is B S L N. And the canonical coordinate, canonical coordinate on O of 1 gives the, so let's call, so here I had E N, this maps to here, let's call S E N the pullback. I don't know, F equals F star of E N gives the canonical trivialization of determinant of S E N. Okay, is that clear? Let me just review. I have the universal bundle on BGLN. I consider its determinant line bundle. Any line bundle on any space, if I pull back the line bundle to itself, has sort of the diagonal coordinate, the identity coordinate. And that's non-zero exactly when I remove the zero section. So that gives me an isomorphism of O of 1 minus 0 with the trivial sheaf on this space. And so that's this space. I remove the zero section from this line bundle. It has the canonical coordinate, which gives you an isomorphism of the determinant of this pullback bundle with the trivial bundle. So this is a universal SLN bundle. And it has the universal property like this. Yeah? This uh, pi. No, I didn't. I said it's a Joanna Lu device, but so if that if that means anything, then you know what it is, and if not, then too bad. Okay. Good. Okay, maybe that's enough. So here's a theorem. It's the it's the analog of this thing. Uh, by Anunevsky. That um, the it's again more general than this is equal to um, W of K adjoin P one. So there are two cases. P n minus one and E. This is for n even. Uh, and sorry, uh, m minus one and even equals two m and p one up to p m and odd equals two m plus one. Okay, and what are these guys? Of course, the p i's are just the p i's of this universal bundle. S E N, and in the even case, E is the Euler class. Well, suitably localized, right? I multiply by the eta of S E N for N even. Okay, so it's very much analogous. And now the splitting principle. Here's the splitting principle. So let me give an example. One example is the case we already know. Remember, we have this identifications of groups. SL2 is the same as SP2, which we've already used. OK, 
Okay. So example, H star of B S L two W is just the polynomial ring over the field with coefficients in the Euler class of S E two. So you should think of this, this is an analog of saying that the, for example, the cohomology of CP infinity, Z coefficients, is Z adjoined C1 of O of minus 1. Right? It's the, it's the analog of that in topology. Okay, so, so now we have the splitting principle, the SL2 splitting principle. Also due to Anyanevsky. It says the following. So let's take n even. So now we have this map, SL2 cross SL2. Here we have m factors embeds inside of SL2m, which is our SLn, right? Just by block matrices. Right? Just put, that's an M. Right? You put a bunch of block two by two matrices into a two M by two M matrix. Okay? So this induces B S L two to the M to B S L two M. Let's call this pi. Then pi star is injective on Vit cohomology. Again, it's more general than this, but it includes this case. And if I take a pi star of the total Pontryagin class of this universal bundle, E2M, what is it? It's the product. So for each factor, I have a universal rank two bundle on this thing. And that gives me an Euler class, call that EI. Right, I can just pull back by the ith projection, the universal bundle on BSL2, right here. That gives me I rank two bundles, one for each factor. It has the Euler class EI, and this is the product of the EI squared. Furthermore, I mean, it's, it basically, it says when you do this, the bundle, I mean, when you're doing this, you're just splitting the bundle into a sum of rank two bundles. That's what this map does to, to the thing. And uh, pi star, of the Euler class here, by the this is just this is just an application of the Cartan formula. The formula is the the theorem is that this then this these two things are just well you need to know that the first Pontryagin class of a rank two bundle is the square of the Euler class. That's the information here, and this thing is equal to the product of the EIs. Okay, so that's the splitting principle. So it's very similar to the uh, splitting principle for churn classes. The difference is you have this square here, and then you have this Euler class, which is the square root. So uh, let me just mention that in general, the Euler class of a rank 2m bundle will be, if we square it, we get pm of the bundle. That's why we didn't need the pm here, because we have its square root already in the even case. Okay, good. So this reduces everything. If I now you give me you give me a let's say an SLN bundle, let's say 2M, and uh, I want to calculate, I take some symmetric power of it, and I want to calculate its Pontryagin classes and Euler class. This says I kind of reduce to the case of understanding what happens with tensor products. And with rank two bundles, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I'm, I'm, yeah, it, that works. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's sort of a, yeah. I mean, it's it's for it's for things like the BSL twos have a Kunit formula because you can just take BSL two over BSL two. So it, that's your new base. So anytime you take BSL two over some base, then the Witt cohomology is the Witt cohomology of the base join on this Euler class, and that follows. Then then you get the Kunit formula from that. Okay, good. So. So now two questions arise. Let's see. Two questions arise. What about, so two questions. Well, a bunch of questions, but two questions. Question one, what about arbitrary bundles? See, this is all for SLN bundles, arbitrary bundles. And secondly, how do I deal with with rank two bundles? I mean, it's still non-trivial to deal with rank two bundles, right? They're not a line bundle. I don't have some kind of additivity, so for tensor product of the Pontryagin class. Okay, so let's. What about one? So the answer to one is in the following proposition. It says the following. So we have, remember, we have uh, this, uh, right? We had BSLN maps to BGLN. Let's call that pi. Remember, this thing was the, the open subset of the line bundle O of 1 over BGLN, and this is just the map. Okay? Then this induces. So let's say n for n even, pi star induces an isomorphism of, see here I still have this determinant. So I have two kinds of Witt cohomology on BGLN. I have the W cohomology and I have the twisted W cohomology. And the point is that's pi. I can take pi star to both of them, and it gives me the cohomology of BSLN. And how do I identify the two? The H star of BGLN W is remember this thing is the polynomial ring in Pontryagin classes and the Euler class is equal to. W of K, and then I have P1, P, N over 2 minus 1, and then E squared, which was P, N over 2. It was E squared. So it's the even powers of E. Remember, E, the Euler class, the universal bundle here, came from pullback from here. So the Euler class here was actually the pullback of an Euler class here, but here I have a trivialization of the determinant, so I don't see the determinant when I write down where the Euler class is living. Here I still see it, and it lives here. So this part corresponds to the, the square Euler classes, which get rid of the twisting, and the other part is equal to W of K, the same thing, I join, you know, let's say P N over 2, which is my E squared, and then times E, it's the ideal. So it's a, this gives you all the odd powers of E, and this gives you all the even powers of E. Okay, so it says you really can reduce to the case of, uh, of things of trivial determinant if you just keep track of how many powers of E you're talking about. And I didn't say too much about the, e, the odd case because I'm running out of time, but basically the odd case, it just involves the Pontryagin classes, and the Pontryagin classes are stable due to the Cartan formula. If you take the ith Pontryagin class of a bundle V, 
it's the same as the ith Pontryagin class of the bundle V plus O. So if you're dealing with an odd rank bundle, you can always make it an even rank bundle. It only has Pontryagin classes and you can just do that. And in fact, that's reflected in the odd case for n odd, then the cohomology of BGLN with the twisted groups is just zero. And the cohomology of BGLN, the W maps isomorphically by pi to the cohomology of BSLN. So the odd case, this part, you know, it, it, there's no Euler class, and so you don't get any odd terms, odd powers of the Euler class, and this, that's just saying this is zero. And okay, so that gives you a complete description of characteristic classes for arbitrary bundles in this setting. And now, what? That's the that's the answer to the first question. And in the last five minutes, so. So this is, uh, the proof of this is basically, you look, BSLN is an open subset in a line bundle over BGLN, and the cohomology of the line bundle of BGLN is the same as the cohomology of BGLN, and under that identification, this pullback map just becomes the restriction map from the cohomology of the line bundle to the cohomology of the open subset, and you have the localization sequence comparing the cohomology of the open subset, the cohomology of the line bundle, and the cohomology of the zero section. And the cohomology of the zero section has exactly the twist which shifts you from W to W of O of 1, and you play with that and gives you all this stuff. Okay, so that's a brief sketch. So let's talk about question two, which is where I'm uh, still working. So. Paul Arna helped me find a much needed gap in my argument. Thought I was finished, but obviously not. So this last bit is still some work in progress. Okay. So Again, for the topologists in the audience, this description of the Witt cohomology of BSLN should remind you of the cohomology ring of BSON. I think it's essentially the same description. And uh, in fact, remember, just a little heuristic. So for two, here's a heuristic, which was already, which was certainly noticed by many people, but certainly I've this I see in Anyanevsky, that over R, let's just look at the topological groups, you take SLN of R, this contains SON, and this is, a, this is a homotopy equivalence, right? So the theory of BSLN of R bundles is the same as BSON bundles. So we do this for any, so we want to, for two, we want to study B, S, L, 2. And in this setting, this is saying S, L, 2 of R is essentially the same as S, O, 2, which is just a circle. And we all know what the representation theory of a circle in the reals looks like, right? Uh, you have a trivial representation, and then you have these various representations, you know, you have the canonical representation just rotating in the plane. And then when you complexify, it be splits in, the, so they're all two-dimensional and they all split into a character and its inverse, right? So representation, irreducible representation of S1 is either the trivial one or it's two-dimensional. And in this case, so if V, if you take VC, it looks like, you know, E to the I n theta, E to the minus I n theta, right? And the conjugation puts the two together. And then if you, you can, of course, then write this in terms of sines and cosines, and you get the, you know, back the real represent, irreducible representation. Okay, so what do you do? Of course, we can't do this algebraically. 
This, this doesn't exist in the world of algebra. So in, for, to replace this, but what's the important point here? Complex conjugation identifies these two things, but we don't have that to play with. So let's just work within the group. We take the torus inside of SL2. That gives us our two characters here. And then we want to join them together. But we have also this additional matrix in here, 0, 1, minus 1. And that, of course, conjugation by this guy will exchange these two factors, right? So, and in fact, this normalizes the torus. So the normalizer of the torus inside here is just the subgroup generated by these two things. It's the torus uh, semi-direct this this you know group this Z mod two generated by this well it's not a Z mod two I guess it's a Z mod four I mean if you well it's not semi direct this thing semi direct the Z mod two generated by this matrix well whatever it is okay group generated by this in this matrix without writing down what it is because I'll screw it up good and the representation theory of this thing looks very similar to the representation theory of S1 because if you restrict to the torus, it'll split your vector space into eigenspaces. And this gadget here will have to exchange a minus n, an n eigenspace with a minus n eigenspace. So it says all the rep irreducible representations will be two dimensional or possibly one dimensional. So it looks very much the same. Now, so what we want to do is we want to look, we want to split our splitting principle further. We want to consider this map here. So this map is a fibration, and what's the fiber? The fiber is SL2 mod NT, right? That's the fiber. And what is SL2 mod, well, let me, let me write it the other way. Not that it matters, so, oh, I'm way out of time, sorry. The point is, if you think about this thing a little bit, this is equal to um, sim 2 of P1 minus the image of the diagonal. And using this description, so this is just a plane, this, this turns out to give you a conic given by the equation uh, T2 squared minus 4T0, T1. Sorry, I lost track of time. And um, looking at this picture, we have the following theorem that um, this map pi, pi star uh, from H star BSL2 W to pi star BNT W is an isomorphism for star bigger than zero and for star equals zero, um, then you have two copies here. You have a short exact sequence, zero to the h zero. It's SL two W, which is just W of K, going to the h zero of B and T W, then going to another copy of W of K to zero, and it and it splits. Okay. So you can use that to try and reduce all the computations of. Shore functors applied to SL2 bundles to shore functors applied to NT bundles, which you then reduce to the two-dimensional case, and you can make calculations there. Okay, sorry for going over time, and thank you very much. Hmm. Uh, so uh, you uh, just mean that you can define in this proposition for this proposition yeah it says that um, the th so it says that all you ha you can use this SL2 splitting principle for arbitrary bundles is what it says yeah which result no I, what it says is if you want to say something you want to prove some identity about characteristic classes of let's say you have some bundles, right? And you want to prove some identity among their Pontryagin classes or Euler classes. You can first uh, pass to this 
this, these line bundles, you take the sum of, you know, sum of the line bundles that trivializes the determinants. That's kind of doing this thing. So you first do that. Now I have SL bundles, and then I can prove, if I prove identities there, it gives me, this tells me how to recover the identities back for the original bundles. It's only a, ah, oh yeah. No, it doesn't work for, for Milner Vid. It only works, the theory of Anyanetsky, I should have said, is only for eta inverted theories. It's for eta inverted SLN oriented theories, his theorems. Here, his theorems I wrote for W, but there are theorems about BSLN, and so there are theories about SLN bundles, and so they're only for theories which admit the theory of uh, Tom classes for SLN bundles and for which eta acts invertibly. Yes, it's very important. And in fact, if you think about it a little bit, so, I mean, the theorem that I'm working for, or working towards, which probably is okay, so what I expect, let's see, what I expect is that if you take this Euler class of sim k of a rank 2 bundle, let's just call it V2, and k is odd. When k is odd, then this is an even rank bundle, and this is in the cohomology of some x with w coefficients. This should just be k times the Euler class of V2. Okay? Now, this E, uh, sorry, it's k times k minus 2 times whatever, 3 times 1, sorry. That's what I expect. Now, uh, and then to the, there's a power here, so I guess how many factors are there? Sort of k minus, minus one. If this is three, there should be two factors, plus one over two. Sorry. Yeah. So this is sort of playing the role of the top churn class of this bundle, right? And if you look at the associated, the same formula for the top churn classes, the coefficient is completely different. So what it's saying is, you have a different, two different worlds. One, the Chow theory, and the other, the Witt theory, and the answers you get are very different. So it, it, you can't really expect to get a uniform answer if you work in the, Groten, in the Milner Witt theory. But, if you're looking, in the end, you're looking for an answer, we push this things down, you end up with something in the Grotendieck-Witt group. The Grotendieck-Witt group fits into a diagram. You have the rank homomorphism going to Z mod 2, W of K. This is a pullback diagram. So if you know the answer in the Witt group, if you know the degree in the Witt group, and you know the degree in the integers, you know the degree in the Grotendieck-Witt group. But this is sort of saying you have to, to find it, you have to split up your problem into two pieces. There's the Witt piece and the Chow piece. And you should probably do them separately. That's the suggestion. Good, good question. Glad you asked. Okay. You yeah. question over there where you've been basically saying that um, the H0 of BSL2 is the invariance of the, of the automorphism. Right, right in front of your, your here, yeah, which which automorphism? Well, this this zero one minus one zero gives you an involution on H zero. Ah, no, but when you pass to B to T, everything vanishes. That's that's the other thing to remark. The cohomology of B T is trivial. It's zero, except in degree zero because you're talking about line bundles, and the, the Euler classes in Witt theory of a line bundle is zero. The Witt cohomology of the torus is zero. So, yeah, that's a good point. Classically, what you would do from BGL2, you'd go up to the torus, that splits things into line bundles, BT is just to the projective bundle on the rank two guy, and you're just splitting the rank two bundle into two line bundles. Right? 
And then you say, okay, I calculate my churn classes there and then take the vial group invariance. This is doing it one step at a time. It's right in the case of, uh, of the Chow groups that the Chow groups of this thing will be the vial group invariance and the Chow groups of the torus. But for the Witt theory, going up to the torus doesn't help because everything dies. So you, you have to stop here. Ah, yes. Let me give you an analog of this theorem. I don't know if you mean by I don't know what you mean by known, but um, I mean I didn't know it. I proved it, but maybe it was known. But let me give you an analog for the real points, which is quite amusing. If you uh, if you take this guy, you take SL two modulo n t and view this as a scheme. So remember this is this sim2. This is, this is p2 minus some conic, which is sim2 p1 minus the image of the diagonal. And over this lives, of course, sim2 p1 minus the diagonal. And this is just p1. I mean, the over this lives p1 squared. Sorry. <laughs> p1 cross P1 minus the diagonal. So now if you look at the real points of this thing, okay, this is a two to one cover. So taking covers is not compatible with taking real points. So that's equal to the real points here. And of course there are two kinds of real points living above it. There's the C points, and there's the R points. Okay. Now, of course, sim two p one itself is p two, so this just becomes R p two, R p two minus the this conic on R, and this conic is actually a p one. So this is just R p one. This is just an s one. And which s one is it? It's not the straight s one at infinity. It's a the round s one. And you get two pieces. This, this part here, the C points, is a disk. And this thing is a Mobius band. So it's, it's, it's equivalent to S1. So you actually have two disconnected pieces, an S1 and a disk. And now that's reflected if you take this bundle, B and T. Well, let's do the two B, S, L, 2. And you take the real points. What happens is this breaks up into two pieces. One piece corresponds to this disk, so that's contractible, is equivalent to BSL2 of R. And the other piece is ESL2 of R. This circle bundle, I mean, remember SL2 is the same as SO2. So the circle bundle trivializes everything. So this is just a point. And that's reflect, that's this theorem here, right? This is an isomorphism for higher cohomology. And then in degree zero, you have two points. So you have two copies of H0, right? You get this extra point gives you another copy of H0. So that's what's going on on the real points. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.